Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown, joined by co-host Mia Araujo, and today we're talking about how to price your work. Uh, this is a tricky topic, and it's related to the topic that we were just talking about um, a few weeks ago, uh, negotiating fair pay. I think another important tool that's valuable for artists to have is understanding how much to price your work. When you're selling it, when you are um, you know, like doing a convention or doing a gallery, uh, creating originals versus prints, what do you price your work at and how much is your work actually worth? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we have different experiences across you know, our respective industries. Um, and so like Mia, I'm really like, I'm actually really curious about this from you because I'm a person who, because I'm mainly digital, I haven't really had much experience pricing my actual originals. I don't sell that many originals. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing like what your expertise behind this is and like what the, um, the thinking behind pricing originals is because I feel like it's so subjective. And yeah. so it, it's, it'll be really helpful to have this conversation for me who wants to do more originals. Yeah, uh, I think it is really subjective. I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really context-based as well. So I yeah. feel like if your intention is to sell your work, that's gonna, you're gonna approach it really differently than if you you know, maybe have a different stream of income and you feel more precious about the work and you're not willing to part with it. And there's different reasons why people might do that. Um, and we can get into that later, but assuming that you wanna sell your work and you wanna build an audience, build a collector base, maybe build a relationship with a gallery and that sort of thing. Um, I feel like um, it, it, it definitely was a lot of trial and error for me early on in my career, but from mm -hmm. the stuff that I've gathered is um, the reason why I said context is because it really depends on which gallery you're showing in, for instance, or um, if you're like an, at an online gallery, something like Everyday Original, for instance, where they have yeah. some price point that they sell at. Um, it's just like, I think for me, like something that really helped was observing what work sold, uh, what price point sold the most, and what, what level of finish uh, whether that artist was really established or, or relatively new. So being a, a, like a real observer of the field that you're getting into or the, or the gallery stable, I guess, uh, like the other artists around you is really helpful. Um, and um, I, I think that starting out, the lowest that you're comfortable pricing something is always best because from a collector's point of view, they want to feel like they got a chance um, every collector that like falls in love with your work is assuming your work is going to go up in value over time and that yeah. you're going to blow up someday and be really famous and that piece that they bought really cheap is going to be a good investment for them even if they love it even if they have no intention of selling it it feels good to be like an early collector of someone you know yeah. so I guess the way that I always think about it is your first show should never be too high because then you can't like keep raising your prices to keep encouraging collectors that your work is is growing in value you know um, cause it is a market, you know, because it's like each art piece kind of has a, a secondary market as well. So, um, yeah. anyway, that's, that's at least how I would start is like, what's the price that you're the most comfortable letting it like partying with it, um, at for your first show. And also just sort of seeing how everybody else prices tends to price work in previous shows. Um, I think as a new artist, you don't want to be someone who's, who's like out pricing, uh, like established artists, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but you also don't want to undersell everybody either, you know, so it's, it is a balance, you know, it's a balancing act, I think. Yeah, it's so different, like the contrast in this topic versus like the other one that we had talked about before, because it seems like in the gallery space in particular, like you do price based on your experience and you can't really price that much because like, like when you're first starting out, because in anybody's eyes, it's like what, you know, I guess not like what right does this person have to price their work as high, <laughs> but it's like comparable value and like being able to kind of like play the long game and raising your value after a while Absolutely. um so that's really interesting uh i'm also really curious as to like even in the same gallery show like if you're doing a solo show what causes you to price a painting for more or less than the next one that you're doing is it the amount of time that you spent like is it the amount of like do you want do you price things more if you love them and want to keep them <laughs> um like you know like like what like what's your logic generally in pricing your pieces uh in the same show I'm really curious about that yeah for me I definitely do it by size so a, a way that I kind of keep it consistent for myself is like let's say I sell a piece like that's around this big for a certain amount uh so let's say it's like 11 like 8 by 10 that's an easier one um mm -hmm. the square inches is 80 you know 80 square inches and so whatever yeah. that price point is 
um, I divide it by 80 and then multiply that out like comparatively for each piece, like the bigger sizes, just to get it like a sort of a, a ballpark figure, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the, like your eight by 10 is 500 or something like that. You would divide that by 80 and that's kind of like your base price per square inch for each piece. I know that sounds kind of complicated, but um, but that's kind of like the base level thing. Cause then the other thing I consider is how much more detailed is this bigger piece, you know? Cause it could be mm -hmm. a bigger piece that's actually not as detailed as a smaller one. So comparatively that one would be more expensive. So um, size, detail, the amount of time it took, um, sometimes medium, you know, it's like I do price my drawings cheaper than I do my paintings, you know? Um, and it's not just because painting is harder for me, even if it was took about the same amount of time, I just tend to price them that way. Um, so all those things definitely come into consideration. Also, the framing is very expensive, like that'll factor in as well. Yeah. Um, and um, and then also, like like you said, if this is just a really favorite piece of mine that I actually don't really want to sell, but I feel obligated to hang it, mm -hmm. I might price it higher to be like, whoever's willing to buy it this high, like they deserve to get it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, definitely. And I wouldn't um, be mad if I didn't sell it, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah, because like I think the most recent like the most recent example that I have of like selling my own work is like my Inktober originals. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely that kind of thing of like, I really like this piece and I don't necessarily want to sell it. So it's going to be higher. So yeah. if anybody wants it, I know they really, really want it. Um, but I like that you have a system around what you like, like what you have. It's like these different like equations of, OK, <laughs> like time spent versus size versus, you know, like X equals, you know, this price. Uh, it helps make it a little bit more objective so that it's, you know, more straightforward to price your stuff. I feel like that would eliminate probably a lot of the anxiety that people might have in terms of pricing their work is to make it more of a subjective, an objective thing where there's a, a specific reason why you're pricing things. And I personally haven't really like done that before, like, and not in like such an organized system. Um, usually, you know, if I, if I do a, an ink drawing versus like a full painting, obviously the painting is going to be more because it takes way more time. But, um, you know, oftentimes, like if it's like the same kind of medium, same general size, then the different, like the price will fluctuate between each piece. Um, so have you had the experience before? Like, I'm curious, like if you had all the, like if you had all your paintings at the same size, what would that look like? Would they all be priced the same or would they be different? Like based on detail, based on your favorites, like how would that change? That's interesting because I've, I've always done shows with varying sizes like um, interesting there's, there's always like a big centerpiece that's like the biggest one that I know no one will probably buy but it's you know it, it it's that's actually a good tactic too if you have a whole solo show to have a big centerpiece of the wow piece that, that you're not assuming will sell but it will bring people there and mm -hmm. it'll also make all the other pieces seem cheaper by comparison right yes um, and that's something to consider too. If you only paint big, then that means the only people that you can sell to are people with really big walls, a lot of wall space mm -hmm. to hang your stuff. So it's always good to have somewhat of a range and to have some smaller pieces in there for new collectors. Cause you always want to encourage people to start collecting your work, you know, and usually people will start with smaller pieces, but in your, in your example, let's say they were all 11 by 14. Um, I think I would probably price them all about the same. And maybe like, if there was two or three in there that were way more detailed or did take me longer, they would be, you know, a few hundred dollars more. But again, yeah. if I'm pricing to sell, I wouldn't like this one's a thousand dollars more, you know, I just wouldn't show it, you know? Yeah. Um, it would, or I yeah, would just, it would just be like too, mm -hmm. way too much of a discrepancy. Yeah. Um, that's all. Yeah. That's also interesting too. I really like that. Like not like, yeah, that tactic of like making sure that there's a piece that draws everybody in. Mm -hmm. Um, because like your centerpiece, even if you don't think it's going to sell, like, it's kind of like, is it like what makes the statement for your gallery show so that people understand like, okay, this is the first thing I see. I know what I'm going to expect now. It's like a piece that sets the tone. Has anybody like ever bought your centerpiece for your gallery shows? They have. And I think I, I just started out painting them smaller. Like I think for my first show, my centerpiece was 18 by 24. So it's mm -hmm. still pretty a decent size that like a collector could hang up on a wall. Um, my most recent show was 60 by 40 inches. So it was the Whoa, biggest, biggest thing I've ever done. And that one's in my parents' living room. They have it. So. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> um, so cool. And I don't mind actually that I never sold it. Like I'm still like, uh, whenever I go over to their place and I look at it, I'm like, I painted that. That's insane. Like I, I painted something bigger than me you know <laughs> yeah that's awesome and and um, again everybody was at that show was congregated around it and looking at it and stuff so it's a great 
it makes for great photos. Again, it really takes up wall space, which is what you want to do. You don't want everything on the gallery wall to look really tiny either, you know? Um, yeah. So, and it adds variety and interest too, but that's, I think I'm kind of going off topic here, but. Um. <laughs> oh no, not at all. Like, this is really nice to, to know too, like of like the strategy of planning a gallery show and like knowing how to, to show your work because that all goes into, you know, it all goes like funnels up to like how much you price it. Um, yeah. But it also just like creates your overall package of, this is my work. This is what I'm here to show. And that show does have value. Uh, and like people being able to see and understand that inherent value of the show probably will encourage them to want to, you know, pay for that more Yeah. because everything feels cohesive. Everything feels like a, like a vision and they're like, oh, like they feel inspired by it and they want to own a part of that vision. That's what they're paying for. So yeah. being able to sell it appropriately is important. Uh, I feel like the same thing definitely goes for conventions too. Mm -hmm. Um, especially as conventions start to ramp back up, people oftentimes don't know how to, how much to charge like for, you know, the things that they're selling. Yeah. Because um, something that I wanted to mention was that like, you're doing these big gallery shows, uh, but these paintings have value outside of their just original because you can make prints of some of these. So when you price a print versus an original, what's your tactic for that? Because I, I have my own uh, strategy, but I'm curious to hear from you because you, you deal with oils. <laughs> They're actually acrylic, but the, a acrylics. lot of people do think they're oh oils. God, yeah. Acrylic. How? How? <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's just what I learned to paint with, and so it's I'm used to it. But um, I have a lot of respect for people who who can paint with oils because. <laughs> Um, but yeah, pricing prints is very different in the gallery setting versus the convention setting. And that was kind of jarring for me at first because I uh, usually at a gallery show, they'll take like your two bit best uh, pieces and make prints out of them. And they'll be like really big giclés, you know, and they'll be like $150, $200, you know, yeah. through, like limited editions or sign and numbered and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And for conventions, I tend to do open edition prints. So um having it be open edition obviously means that you can print an infinite amount of this run and so it decreases the value in the sense that obviously if it's an edition of 25 there's only 25 ever made um and that's the other thing too you want to be careful that if you're making only 25 of an image that you feel like oh no once this runs out I wish I could have printed more maybe you should do a slightly bigger edition but you kind of can't re-release the same size again yeah you have to do something different you either have to hand embellish it or do a different size print or, or do a, a different process like silk screen or, or something else um, to justify selling that image again because you don't want to piss off the collectors that thought it was an edition of 25. Yeah um, like that would be a really really bad tactic to do that to somebody. Yeah and it's it's not worth doing that just to make a little more money so that's just something that's kind of like you know collecting 101 that you definitely don't want to piss off the collector but mm -hmm. that's what the great thing is about open editions you do it on a different paper uh, a different size usually I do my open editions at 11 by 14 um, and I pick a standard size that you can find a frame for at any store without having to do custom framework that's always yes. a good rule of thumb um, and those are things like 8 by 10 9 by 12 11 by 14 you know there's standard sizes you see at Michael's or whatever um, that's usually good um, like I said I use a different stock I make it open edition so I actually sell my prints for $30 um, at that size um, I tend to not go higher I think just because I haven't done enough conventions but let's say I was selling them like hotcakes and it, they were just like flying off the shelves at that price then maybe I would think of of going up a little bit you know yeah but that's something too you kind of have to gauge it I started out doing my prints at $15 back in 2017 and that felt way too cheap but I didn't really know um and so and that's the thing too you don't want to set your prices too low even at conventions because then it people come to expect that they won't actually follow you for the higher price point the way they might in a gallery setting, you know? Exactly. So there's that as well. Um, yeah. And I've definitely made that mistake too, where I also had priced, you know, $15 for an 11 by 17. That's like not, that's yeah. not enough money. And I, I remember at the time, like before I was charging 12 when I was first started out. And then I thought 15 was so much. And then I realized I'm like, no, like it's really not that much. Like this is on really good paper stock. This is like, you know, I'm not making a ton of runs of this, these prints, even though there are open edition. Um, but it was understanding that like, you know, again, like this art to have is valuable. And uh, even though it's a print, like 15 is, is just too low. Uh, and now also that I'm printing uh, from home on my own, you know, very, very great quality paper stock. Um, yeah. That, like they, the prints are worth more. So mm -hmm. I also charge 30 for them now. Um, for the smaller ones, obviously they're a little cheaper. 
uh, the 20 for like the eight and a half, but like, it's still, you know, a price where I feel like it's worth, you know, the time and effort to like, you know, maintain the printer to get the, you know, the good paper um, to get the good, you know, quality, the top quality prints, um, you know, all that stuff goes into it. So yeah. it's okay to be able to charge, you know, what you think that's worth, because I think a lot of people don't really take into account the amount of effort that they're spending they don't they don't they don't apply that as part of the costs of a lot of things that they do especially when they're first starting out and so um that whole section of the work is like left out and so you end up probably making less than you know minimum wage when you charge super low for the stuff that you're making because like you're not accounting all of your time and effort that's spent to making that thing the piece and yeah. you know that that's put into like putting that in front of somebody's face and allowing them to buy it um so it's something to, to definitely consider definitely yeah I actually signed my open edition prints just to add extra value as well which I don't know maybe I should be charging more than for that I don't number them though maybe and then I do have a, a thick like backing board so it feels like in your hand it feels thicker you know like it feels more substantial as well and then I put a, a card on the back that has a bit of the story to it so it oh, feels that's like awesome a, a full package you know it's not just like a piece of paper or whatever which again that's that's the psychological thing we as artists think like I'm charging this much for a piece of paper but it's not just that you know mm -hmm. and there's ways that you can add more value to it to justify the cost um to people at shows and point that stuff out when you're selling it and just like turn it over and be like hey you can read what's on the back or whatever yeah. or it's signed or whatever it is but um yeah, some people do embellished editions of prints and that's how you can, you know, sell the same size for more money as well, but just mm -hmm. maybe do less of those because you don't want to be caught embellishing like a thousand prints or anything. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I've seen a lot of artists like do gold leaf and uh, different like extra details that are hand drawn and those are definitely worth more. Yeah. Um, and I think as an artist, like if you want to make more on your prints, but you don't feel comfortable in charging more for them, then that's a great way to add value is to be able to, um, if you have any details that you can add or any special like ways that you can make that a more unique item, then, um, you know, it's definitely worth pursuing. But once again, like, you know, part of what you're charging for is the time that you're taking yeah. to, to add those embellishments to the print. So don't forget about that aspect of your work. Yeah. That's actually a good point to point out with, um, sites like Inprint or whatever, like they tend to charge a lot less than we do at conventions, but don't forget that they're massive companies that are doing massive print runs and they're fulfilling and stuff like that. And so, I, I think you also have to value your time as the artist, as the creator that's taking time yes. away from creating to package and print and, you know, ship stuff to like be a ship fulfillment company. Yes, it costs money to do that. So that you build that cost into your products that you sell, you know, mm -hmm. exactly um, until you yes. can afford to outsource it or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. And sites like imprint too, like the actual return that you, that you as an artist gets is so little it because so there's so much of the work taken out of that. There's a reason why you're getting charged so little because like, like running the printing press and doing all the legwork for that takes so much effort. And so, um, you know, like the reason why you're only getting $6 for a $15 print is because like they've taken care of that whole process for you, the shipping, the fulfillment that, you know, so it's, there's a lot of stuff that you need to consider. Um, my online prints are a little bit more expensive than the, the ones that I saw at conventions because of all that. Like it's a lot of maintenance to do at home. And, um, you know, like having to get the tubes and like to, you know, to get the packaging and to ship it and to like go to the, like mail it out, like all that takes extra. Yeah. So, um, you know, as opposed to a convention where I bring it to you and I just hand you the print and you walk away with it. It's like, it's so much more complicated. So if you find that prints maybe more expensive online, that's the entire reason right there. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of work to be able to, to collect and, um, you know, and to do all that. So. Uh, appreciate that a little more people if you if you're like oh I don't want to pay for this much it's like oh you can you could do you know uh red bubble or whatever but <laughs> yeah. it's not really going to get you the same thing that you're going to get from an artist just FYI that's, that's actually a good point that you brought up though that you changed the pricing in person like you're giving people an incentive for attending the show and stopping by your table on those three days mm -hmm. um and then if they want to buy it on their own time they're going to pay more online that, that's yes. a great uh strategy and it's not you shouldn't feel bad about that you know no you shouldn't the people go out of their way to go there in person are making that extra effort, you know, to yeah. come to you. So you should reward them for it. Yeah, exactly. If you, and if people are middling on the fence, it's a good thing to, to tell them too. It's like, okay, like if you want to buy it later, you can buy it online, but just know that you have to pay shipping and, um, you know, like the handling fees. Uh, and so oftentimes people would be like, oh, like they forget that like there's an extra cost associated with it. Yeah. Um, and so they, they are more incentivized to buy the in-person thing because they're like, okay, like I can just have this print now rather than do all the hassle later. 
So um, it's definitely more worth it to be able to sell things in person. Uh, it's easier on everybody to do so. So, um, and it also saves on materials too. I love, we love saving the environment out here. So yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's definitely a good, a good thing to have. Um, and I, I really like what you said too, about like adding the different kinds of, uh, you know, not embellishments, but just like the different uh, perks of having a print from you, being able to package it up, being able to brand it, being able to like make it a complete thing. All those things do add that inherent value to it, as well as making it feel more valuable to the consumer. So um, it will make you feel less bad for, uh, you know, less bad. Like you shouldn't feel bad for charging what you're worth, yeah. but um, people who get, receive the print will feel like this is a valuable item. This is something that is deserving to be hung up in the home. And I feel like I got a good thing for my money that I spent, um, you know, like thinking about the complete package and like what you're get, what you're delivering to somebody. Um, another tactic that I see too at conventions that I like to do is uh, to bundle uh, different prints and to do discounts for bundling. Um, we also love getting rid of all of our prints because we don't want to go home with all that stuff. <laughs> so, hey, buy three of them. You can get them for a little bit less. And, um, you know, it's like, obviously each individual print is worth a little bit lower, but the overall thing is that you're having somebody walk away with three of your things and they get more from you. They get value out of that. You get value out of that because you're getting rid of your stock. And um, they have more of your art to show, which, you know, potentially can get you more kind of like notice from someone who goes to their house and be like, oh, who's this artist? And uh, so all of these things go into, you know, the bigger thing of like, you have to choose like how you add value to your work, how you advertise it and, um, and what it's ultimately worth. So usually what I recommend is like, you have your base price for your prints. Maybe it's a little bit higher than your bundle price, but the bundle price should be a really good deal should be somewhere around like 15 to 20% off, I think. Um, and like, it still ends up at a price that you're like, okay, like you're comfortable with selling your print, but um, but yeah, you end up selling more because of it and you end up making people happy because of it. Cause they're like, oh, I got one for free or, oh, I got one for, you know, $5 discount. Um, and I, I think that it's always a good tactic to have at conventions, not just for prints, but for other merch that you're selling at your table too. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to ask you what you think, cause this is kind of a tricky a uh, topic that I think a lot of people struggle with in terms of, I think the, the convention side of it, especially sometimes like when you see how people are selling their stuff, it feels very much like trying to cut people deals, you know, trying to like discount things, but isn't there kind of a, sometimes it feels a little bit like wrong to do that with art, right? Cause it feels like you can very quickly go into devaluing the art. So it's like, what is the fine line between that? Because I completely agree. I do the actually discounts for for several prints as well yeah. because again it's a sheet of paper but it's like for me the, the line I draw is like I do not discount originals ever you yes know? yes and I was actually going to bring that up too like I I, I was going to make the, make the caveat I was like I never do this for originals yeah I never do it for originals do not discount your originals um you know like if like if somebody's trying to negotiate with you on them then that's up to you take that by a case-by-case basis but discounting them by default like two originals like are you know less than one or no no, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, that, is, that is also absolutely my line. I do not discount those because like those are all of your individual effort. Like we do not eval devalue our individual effort, but for a bundle of something that you, you have printed off, that is much easier to discount because again, that is a sheet of paper uh, to the artist, to you, to the person, the value is in the art that you're displaying. So it has more inherent value to them than it does to you. It's like speaking of which, I was just going, I was cleaning out my room, um, you know, yesterday and under my bed was just like a bunch of old prints that like, I'm not going to sell anymore because they're from like 10 years ago. And I'm like, these are just, these are just here. Like, what are these doing for me? Like, what is this? Like, so they mean nothing to you to have these prints. Like you just want to get, again, that's why like, it's so much better to have uh, those discounted bundles or to, you know, like to be able to have a good uh, kind of like sale for yourself. Yeah. Because uh, ultimately for the consumer, it's way more valuable to them than it is to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like that's okay. But your originals are always going to be very valuable because that is your own effort. That yeah. is your like, concentrated effort, your first shot at something. So yeah, don't, don't ever discount those. Yeah. And actually, that's a great point that I remember one of my art mentors from back like 10 years ago told me when he was like saying, wow, you sell all your originals. Maybe you should keep some of them because you never know like someday like 
I think he was kind of implying too that sometimes your prices might go up in value. It might be good to keep some of them so you can sell yeah. them when they're actually worth more. But for me at the time, I was like, I'm hungry. I need to eat. You know what I yeah, mean? Like, like you have I to need make to money. get rid of these. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you also think like, I'll make better work. But sometimes better work isn't necessarily more valuable, you know? Like, it's true. Um, it's true. So anyway, that's something else to think about that it's like maybe from each stage of your, of your as you evolve, maybe hold back one piece or something. I don't know. Like, it's not a bad idea if you if you can afford to, to hold on to stuff uh, mm-hmm. here and there. But like, don't get rid of everything. Because I could see that being a thing where it's like actually my partner did this he sold all his magic art very early on because he needed to eat and man does he wish he held on to some of them now you that know what I mean worth like, so much yeah so much so you never know you never know how much that art might be worth in 20 years you know yeah so. I definitely think it's like air on the side of like you can you can price it a little bit higher than you know you feel even maybe if you feel comfortable with because again mm-hmm. originals have a lot of value and um and they're, yeah, again, like they're always probably going to appreciate over time. So, uh, I mean, it's something that I want to definitely get into more because like having originals and like having, it's a, it hits way different when mm-hmm. somebody buys your originals versus when somebody buys a print or an enamel pen or something like that. Like when it's like the one thing that you've made, that's it's one of a kind piece, like the both of you hold that in much more high esteem and it just feels really, really good to be able to sell. But it also kind of like, you know, oh, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know like sometimes you want to keep it you're like oh dang so yeah for the ones that you want to keep you can definitely price those higher that's totally fine (laughs) like what you said earlier um yeah that's really interesting to me speaking of conventions too like because that's what I have most experience with uh like pricing your commissions oh my god this is this is similar to the topic of negotiation but like commissions um oftentimes are not really a negotiation it's like what the artist is setting so I think that fits much more under pricing your work fairly or like pricing your work for yourself um yo yo (laughs) when I first started out doing conventions I was like yeah I'm gonna do commissions for five dollars each oh no lord (laughs) what were you doing for five dollars like a whole figure or I was 23 and I was an idiot actually no I think I was like 22 oh whatever I was young (laughs) I was young and very it's very so stupid stupid yeah that would be like tiny you know um it would be about like I think like four by sixes uh but oftentimes they were like full figures or like a scene or you know and they would have color like why like they would have color why awful (laughs) and I was like I you know I would rack up these things I would get like 30 of them and I thought I was making so much money and then I would be stuck with the bill afterwards of getting stuck at my table doing commissions. And then after the table was over doing commissions instead of hanging out with my friends. And I'm like, very quickly, I was like, why, why am I doing this? And so, uh, you know, eventually I started pricing, I started charging more, but okay, $25, still way too low. Um, And then I was like, okay, $50. And then I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Because like you think about commissions and again, it's something that's done for an individual. It's something that like you don't feel comfortable probably pricing as high as like an actual original or uh, you know a piece that's in a gallery or a piece that's for a company. But when you think about it, that work is an original for a specific purpose. I feel like it's worth more almost than an original piece that's like hanging there because like an original you've done for yourself, but like you're tailoring this original for a specific person's tastes and needs. Yeah, I feel like that's really valuable. It's like tailoring, like you pay a lot of money to tailor clothes to yourself as opposed to buying it off a rack for a reason, custom to you, to you, this is custom art, you know, and you get to call the shots, then you're going to pay more, you know, that's how I (laughs) do it. Speaking of clothing, you buy a a one of a kind wedding dress for a really high price, but if you, if you request, like if you're commissioning a wedding dress, you're, you're going to be paying top dollar for that bad boy. So I feel like commissions should be the same way. I don't, I, I'm so baffled as to why commissions are so undervalued, but I think it's because artists are just like a lot of people who do commissions are trying to make a quick buck and they, they need to pay bills. They need to, you know, to, to survive. I, I totally get it, but the price and value of commissions is just so low. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we should just like normalize, like start to normalize the price, what you're like of what you're charging for a commission. Because again, you are working with a client who you're tailoring an original piece to their specific needs. And like, I know this is digital commissions, notwithstanding, I'm just talking about original commissions. Mm -hmm. Digitals are still an original piece for them. So Mm -hmm. this is still worth a lot of money. 
Um, but I feel like, again, like, think about the amount of time that you have to spend for that person. Think about the amount of time that you probably have to spend like revising or looking at their references or even if they gave you references um, and value it appropriately. Like try not to charge, like undercharge for a commission just because like this is something that um, it really does take effort and commissions can be really soul sucking from experience, from experience. This is, I, I don't do commissions anymore. Yeah, because I, they, I just such a drain. Like I, I I don't take any right now, but um, I took very few even previously because it just felt like to me it's like I would just rather do my own stuff or work for a client that's going to pay me thousands, you know, or whatever. Yes. Else. Otherwise, I will just do my stuff or wait tables, you know. So for me, I was just very strict on my commission policy of like what I would take. Um, but I would usually do them privately. So like if someone emailed me, I would give them a price list. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of my, uh, like I have a whole thing where someone asks me what commissions are, I start with a price list and then if they're interested, then I give them all the terms and I say, you're allowed to choose stuff, but I'm allowed to refuse the content if I don't want to do it, you know? So I have certain things where it's like, I'm not just going to drive anything for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I accept 50% up front and then 50% upon delivery, you know, like completion or whatever. And that's always good because you want people to have skin in the game. Another mm-hmm. thing I would recommend people say is it's non-refundable because I have had people yes. who tried to get me to do something back and forth and then halfway just said, you know what? I want all my money back. And it's like, absolutely not. I did this work. Yeah. If you like, want to see it through, it's still work I did. So you have to pay it, you know? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and again, that's something that you negotiate in the contract too of like, yeah. you know, like if you, like when we, you terminate this thing, you have to pay 50% of the fee of the art because you've already put an effort towards creating the thing. And yeah. like, there have been some clients where like, they're like, oh, like, I don't think I want this right now. Or I think I don't need this anymore. And like, they didn't want to pay me for the amount of effort I already put into it. And I'm like, no, like those were my hours that I already spent exactly. working on this thing. Even if you're not using it, that's still my time. My time is worth money. So, you know, like, and also, cause if you think about it, it also costs, it costs you time and effort to, and it's valuable to them to see like, maybe what they don't want. Like it helps them like, kind of like understand it's like, oh, maybe I don't need, I know now I don't need this anymore. And that's a benefit to them. So them not paying you, like that's like never let them not pay you. Never let them not yeah, pay you. Definitely. That's your time. Absolutely. Yeah. But this, then also to your be... point. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, please go on. No, no, I, I was gonna move back to your your uh charging five dollars for a commission. Ugh. Um no, but like, this is a great example. Cause I've had friends that it's like, they were just like, Oh, but it's like a silly drawing. I can charge that much. And that's the thing. It's like your silly drawing is still your effort. And it's still, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter how silly or how easy it is. It's work. You know, it's like, you, maybe your style is kind of a silly t- tongue in cheek style, but it's not any less valuable than someone's really highbrow kind of work, you know? And so I think that that's another thing too, where people feel like I should charge less because my stuff's not as detailed or because it's funny or because it's silly or something. Mm-hmm. And don't devalue your work based on any of those things. It's your work, you know, yeah. it's, your, it's your vision. And I know that might sound too highbrow for some people whose st- style is maybe more cartoony or whatever, but it's still your vision. You know, it's still something that should be valued. And um, as good as it might feel to have like 30 people come and throw $5 at you, those people actually are not valuing that effort that you put in because it only cost them $5. Whereas yep. if they saw the price tag was $100, let's say, they might be like, wow, that person's making custom art and maybe value the act more yes. because it doesn't cost $5. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, so even though there's less people, you you only need like two people to come in and commission you <laughs> and exactly. only be drawing to the price of 30. So anyway. Yeah. And yeah, once again, for sure, like that, those five, like those, you know, $5 commissions, like getting like 40 of them at convention, like I could have just, I can't do math right now, but like, I could have just gotten a few commissions at a way higher, like a better price point yeah. and done like five of them mm-hmm. for that, sa- to get that same amount of profit. Like that would have been so much better for my mental health yeah. and the amount of time I could spend with my friends or spend at the convention, because like, you know, like I also want to live and like experience things if you're wrapped up just like working and working and working because you didn't charge enough, uh, that's, you know, you, you stuck yourself in this position Yeah, and you don't want to do that to yourself. So yeah, having a great understanding is really, really valuable. Um, of like knowing what you're worth. I have seen some artists like at conventions doing, um, you know, $5 I'll draw like with my left hand or something like that. Like, I feel like those are like fine because like, those sure. are so quick. They require no effort. But then also you will get a lot of people requesting that too. So imagine like mm. understanding where your threshold is of when to close your commissions and when to take that sign down and be like, okay, like I'm burnt out. I'm done for the day. 
um, knowing when to limit it and stop it because like I definitely I was so desperate for money that I just would never take my sign down even if I was swamped with work yeah. and I would just get requests and requests and never say no so you know it's a it's about being able to say no after a certain point so that you can focus on the workload that you already have yeah really, really another, important. yeah for sure I'm glad you brought that up that's actually a really good point because it, again it doesn't matter how much money you need if you're burnt out you're not going to do good work and it's not going to generate more work in the future but the other piece is, is that with original work as well you don't want to flood your market ever like that's actually yes. like one of the worst things to do to your collector base because you do devalue your, your work if you're someone who works fast um and that you make work very quickly don't you don't have to sell all of it you know you want to create demand and yes. that's something i would see a lot too in, in the gallery world that it's like um if there was like a flooded market of certain artists work it suddenly just even no matter how good it was it just felt like oh i can always get one of these so i don't need to get it right now you mm -hmm. want to have that perceived value through scarcity as well so yeah there's no um, sense of urgency there when there's just a ton of it to to you know choose from yeah. so yeah like pacing yourself and curating uh, what you do at a gallery or at a convention mm -hmm. um because like you know those old prints like I could potentially put them up but I, I don't want to because like it's not a good representation of what I do anymore mm -hmm. and what I want to be able to do is to be able to curate a good experience for people who are coming to my table and knowing what my point of view is a lot of those prints that I had made back in the day were like when I didn't really know what my point of view was and you can tell mm -hmm. and that would just muddy the entire objective so it's like it's important to be able to curate and to cut out the things that are not serving you. And um, again, that'll ascribe value to it because like you're coming from a complete package and people will want to, you know, they'll they'll find it more valuable than something that's just all over the place. Totally. That's yeah. Great. So focus your energies. Don't undercharge for your work. And, you know, if you uh, want to know more about this topic or have any questions, like please feel free to put them in the comments. Um, we will try to get to them and answer them as we can. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious to see what kind of work you're selling and, um, and if you, uh, have experiences or advice even, uh, on how to price your work and what tactics you use if you're at a convention or a gallery or selling in any other circumstances, would love to hear from y'all, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation and, um, you know, uh, thanks for sticking with us. We'll talk to you later.